But I have the privilege of having known and worked with Penny over many, many years, um, from when I was myself a teacher working in a school for children with severe and profound and multiple learning difficulties in Hertfordshire, and accessing her work myself as a teacher, to having the privilege of working with her as a university colleague on a number of different projects over the year, including inclusive literacy, some of you might remember that, and indeed that the volume that's the Routledge Companion to Severe Learning Difficulties that we published just after Penny so sadly passed away. And it was such a tribute to her uh, and so brilliant to be involved with her on that publication, which is crucial in the field. Um, I, I remember when we were working on the Inclusive Literacy Project, Penny came uh, to stay with me. I worked for Plymouth University at the time, and I live in Exmouth by the sea. So I picked her up and said, oh, we'll drive along the seafront before we go to my house, shall we? And she said, yeah, yeah, I don't think she was actually that interested. It's me that lives by the sea because I love it. But it was pouring with rain, so we had to drive along the seafront in the pouring rain. And I think really all Penny wanted to do was to get to the house and have a cup of tea. <laughs> Uh, but it was lovely for, to spend that time with her as well. So my own PhD was about um, researching my own classroom practice and part of that was to do with pupils' involvement in their own self-assessment and my real concern with the objectives, the behavioural objectives that we were expected to write at the Times. Um, they weren't even called smart targets then, which is ageing me. And, uh, I'm afraid, but they were much the same thing in a way, and they just troubled me at the time, and, and I remember having a whole chapter in my PhD about this, so out come scruffy targets later on, and that's just a joy to keep uh, bringing that up. As Julie said, every time anyone said, mentions smart, I go, it's, it's hanging there in the air. Um, but today I'd like to, I'm probably going to be a little bit more academic and a bit more, uh, think about the curriculum, so taking on board uh, the round hole and square peg, or with the other way around, square hole and round peg, and, and I'm not entirely sure that I totally agree with that either, so I'm going to try and be a little provocative maybe, and um, put some ideas together around tensions and issues when we're talking about curriculum, and when we're talking about curriculum particularly for pupils with severe, profound and multiple learning difficulties. So we'll see how we go, and it's shut me up if I go on too long, won't you? So this a number of different issues that I'm going to bring attention to. So the actual nature of the curriculum itself is one of those. So curriculum can be viewed in much, many different ways, but if it's, if it's viewed as transmission, it's typically about someone having knowledge, as uh, Graham was saying, standing at the front, if you like, and, and having this knowledge that they pour into children and young people, etc. Uh, I'm being very basic and um, blunt, really. Um, curriculum can also be seen as product, which is a bit more like the notion of the objectives. Well, if we follow that, we'll get to that outcome. A bit managerial, a bit bureaucratic, a bit like it's a process in a factory almost. Or curriculum can also be viewed as process. And I think that is where I have lived my life, in that curriculum is to do with relationships between people and knowledge. But it is about that process of developing that knowledge together, whether that's with PhD students or children and young people with the most profound learning difficulties. And one of the things I'm in awe of Penny for is the way she managed to maintain that practice and academic mix. It's really hard when you work in a university to keep that going, and I was always in awe of her for that. So I think that's an issue that's for all children and all notions of curricula, but maybe is particularly specific to this young group of young people. And here's another issue that has bugged us over the years, over the years that I've been working in education, about inclusion and curriculum, and you know, inclusion is a word that continues to excite and trouble us. So these quotes are quite old, and they're not specific to severe learning difficulties or profound and multiple learning difficulties. They're more uh, general than that, but I think they help us think about the issues. So the key to inclusion is inclusive learning, but to achieve inclusive learning, pupils must be included in the curriculum. Many, many years ago, the children we are talking about did not receive education, were not considered to be edu educable at all. But this alternative quote puts a different view on this. The priority for children with special needs, therefore, is that they have access to curricula where it's appropriate for them, not that they're fitted into a curriculum designed for the mainstream population which may not meet their particular needs, which was Peter's point, I think. But if they're not included, then have we separated them out too far? And I think that's been a perpetual issue over the years. And sometimes I think about it in different sorts of diagrams. I'm not sure I've got all of these uh, 
there's probably many more we could think about. So if we do think there is a specific curriculum for specific groups of children, young people, how should it be visualised? How should it be played out? And over the years, I think we've seen a number of this, those different diagrams in operation. So many, many years ago when I started teaching in a special school, we had a very, very separate specific curriculum that was nothing to do with what was taught in mainstream, so that top left-hand um, box, if you like. Over the years, the National Curriculum came in, hadn't thought about this group of young people at the time at all, and it was sort of everyone was slotted into that. How on earth could we access that mainstream national curriculum? And uh, with Penny and Tina Tilstone, who's somewhere in the room, a number of us worked on curriculum guidelines trying to sort of help. How can we access this but still stay true to what we believe in? How do we put these things together? Um, and some of that specific curriculum, wherever we put it, has always troubled me a little. Um, so I'm a bit disparaging about, about what I call shopping, cooking and duvets. Having worked with post-16, having worked with young people who were post-16 in a special school, those were the things that were quite measurable. You could break them down into umpteen different objectives. Uh, and yet for me, it was much more about people and relationships and how you communicate and how you can go out into the world and talk to somebody or say no to something. And so... I am a bit disparaging about shopping, cooking and duvets whilst understanding that such daily living skills are important to our lives. Um, so I've always been a bit troubled by some of those things myself. Um, and I think ultimately what we're trying to do is those things tend to push against each other. Somewhere along the line there's some notion of curriculum entitlement. As a society we have agreed that there are areas of knowledge, ways of thinking, ways of being, which are important for our children and young people to take part in. And for me, I don't like to draw a line. Well, that's for those, but not for that. Somewhere, there's a continuum, isn't there? And so I think we have to think about that for all of our young people. And yet they also, all, all children and young people have individual needs, but, and these young people we're talking about today have perhaps very specific individual needs. But those things clash together a bit, and I think that's what we are continually, and I don't know how different it is now really, trying to fit those two together. Uh, and that's what Penny did too. So I know that some of you come from schools that she worked with, and that, so she has worked with schools on um, developing a curriculum that's in different sort of phases, the informal, the semi-formal, and the formal. And that was one way of dealing with some of those issues, I think. So there's a few more issues that, that can be problematic, things that have continued to, to trouble the field. Should we be providing our children and young people with a very wide range of experiences so we open the world to them, or should we be focusing on very priority areas like communication or toileting or feeding, or, you know, so where, where is that balance for our children and young people? How age-appropriate should we be? And I know there will be critics of flow over the years who say, what on earth are you doing that with 18-year-olds? And there'll be many others who will say, oh, come on, they're developmentally at that level. That is absolutely right for them. It's a continuing sort of uh, issue. Um, how independent... Independence in special schools for children with severe learning difficulties is a continuing mantra. We are encouraging these young people to be independent. And as we know, none of us are totally independent. We all need support in various ways. So what do we mean by that? How much support? Where's that balance? Um, similarly, with the breadth and balance, and yet it needs to be differentiated and appropriate and relevant. And the, over the years, we have talked about learning about subjects and learning through subjects. So I think my message for the field, which I had 10 minutes to play around with uh, in, the fit, in the area of curriculum, is, is to continue thinking about that curriculum in critical ways so that we don't go back to, and I'm sorry I repeat it that way, what I was doing umpteen years ago that was shopping, cooking and duvets, but we don't just do national curriculum subjects which weren't really thought about for these young people either, but we continually upset and think about those in our minds, think about the young people we're working with and the world that we're all living in. And I think that Jacques Delors work uh, helps us think about those different aspects that for all young people, but perhaps you know, today we're thinking specifically about these, Learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together and learning to be are some things that we can take forward. 
So I hope I've been slightly provocative and got you thinking a bit. And, and uh, it's thanks to Penny to helping me with that thinking over the years as well. So thank you.